In this podcast, I explore stories of darkness from history, myth, and legend. I am Dennis Sarah, and this is Evil. In 1973, a professor from the University of Illinois obtained a medical journal from Vera Olov. The journal was written by Vera's grandfather, Dr. Vitaly Orlov, in the late 1940s. Dr. Olov specialized in insomnia and had passed away earlier that year. He had defected to the United States in 1951 from Soviet Russia. According to Vera, her grandfather did not talk much about his years in the Soviet Union. According to the journal, sometime shortly after World War II, Soviet researchers were conducting sleep deprivation experiments. These experiments culminated in a 30-day test on five political prisoners using an experimental gas stimulant. Dr. Orlov did not name who the prisoners were, but in the journal, he did refer to one as Victor. The prisoners were kept in a sealed environment to carefully monitor their oxygen intake so the gas didn't kill them, as the gas was toxic in high concentrations. A chamber was set up with microphones and five-inch thick glass portal-sized windows for observation. The chamber was stocked with books, a chessboard in pieces, running water in a toilet, and enough military rations to last all five for over a month. Everything was fine for the first nine days. The prisoners hardly complained, as they had been promised that their sentence would be reduced to the length of the experiment if they saw it through and did not sleep for those 30 days. Their conversations and activities were monitored. As the days passed, they increasingly talked about traumatic incidents in their past, and the general tone of their conversations were increasingly darker as time went on. After ten days, they started to complain about their circumstance and started demonstrating paranoia tendencies. After twelve days, the prisoners stopped talking to each other and began to alternately whispering into the microphone. It appeared they thought they could win the trust of the researchers by turning on their fellow prisoners. The researchers suspected that this paranoia may be a side effect of the stimulant gas. After 14 days, one of the prisoners began screaming. He would run the length of the chamber repeatedly screaming at the top of his lungs. It was reported that it lasted for almost three hours until he was only able to produce an occasional squeak from his damaged vocal cords. The researchers noted that the most disturbing thing about the screaming prisoner's behavior was how the other captives reacted to it. They didn't seem to notice at first. After 15 days, the other prisoners continued to whisper into the microphones. Then a second of the prisoners started to scream. The first seemed to silently scream along with him, both prisoners running back and forth. After 16 days, the three quiet prisoners began to calmly tear the books apart. When that was complete, they smeared feces over everything, including the observation portals. All of this was taking place as the other two prisoners ran back and forth, trying to scream. After 17 days, with the researchers unable to see through the feces-covered portals, they noted the room fell silent. No whispering, no screaming, Nothing. After 18 days, still nothing. After 19 days, the researchers heard only running water. When the experiment reached its 20th day, after much debate, 
the researchers broke experimental protocol and used the intercom. They hoped to provoke a response from the prisoners. They were met by only the sound of someone turning off the running of water. After 21 days, the researchers were desperate and announced over the intercom, We are opening the chamber door to conduct brief medical examinations. Step away from the door, lie flat on the floor, and obey the doctor's instructions. Any deviation from these orders will result in immediate and lethal force from the armed guards. Compliance will earn one of you your immediate freedom. It is reported that a single response came from inside the chamber. We do not desire to be freed. The researchers were unable to provoke any other response using the intercom. They finally decided to open the chamber door on the 22nd day. When the guards were in place, the stimulant gas was flushed from the chamber and filled with fresh air. Immediately, three prisoners on the microphones began to object. They pleaded with the researchers to turn the gas back on. The chamber was opened and the guards were sent in to retrieve the prisoners. The prisoners started to plead louder. Upon opening the door, the guards hesitated as they stared inside. Three inches of water covered the floor. It was mixed with feces and blood. One of the prisoners lay dead in the water with chunks of his flesh and guts stuffed into the drain. It appeared he had eviscerated himself. The remaining prisoners had deep scratches throughout their bodies, scratch patterns that indicated they were self-inflicted. Each prisoner had deep bite wounds on their arms as if they had been chewing on themselves. The prisoners had torn their own clothes from their bodies and their fingers were worn to the bone. One prisoner had gouged his own eyes out and was murmuring to himself in the corner. The armed guards at the facility were hardened World War II veterans and they were hesitant to enter the chamber. The prisoners screamed at the researchers and guards. They altered between begging and demanding to be left in the chamber and that the gas be turned back on. They were fearful of falling asleep again. When the guards moved in, the prisoners fought them. Several guards suffered lacerations and bite wounds. It took a dozen guards and researchers to move the prisoners. Dr. Olaf noted in his medical journal, the prisoners fought like cornered animals. In the struggle, one of the prisoners ruptured his spleen and was bleeding internally. The medical researchers attempted to sedate him, but this proved difficult. He was injected with four times the necessary dose of potassium bromide and still fought like a madman breaking the arm of one of the guards. The prisoner fought furiously against his restraints while the researchers attempted to put him under. He almost managed to tear through a four-inch wide leather strap on his right wrist. In those moments, the prisoner realized he could not resist the sedative any longer. He was slipping into unconsciousness. Dr. Olive noted the look of utter horror in the prisoner's face. The prisoner could only mouth the words, Stop, please, as he blacked out. Soon after the prisoner's eyes closed, his heart stopped. Later, an autopsy would reveal the prisoner had broken nine bones in the struggle. The majority were broken from the force exerted by his own muscles. The surviving prisoners were strained and moved to another room. The blind prisoner continued to murmur, I am free. I am free. I am free. 
While the remaining prisoners were secured, an argument broke out between the researchers and the military officer in charge of the facility. The military wanted to dispose of the prisoners, but the researchers wanted to further test the subjects. Apparently, the argument became quite heated as the lead researcher claimed the experiment was ultimately under his authority, and the military officer claimed the military had authority over the entire facility. The two continued to argue and neither would relent. The argument spilled over to the room of the restrained prisoners, researchers standing off with the armed guards. As the argument continued to escalate, the two parties failed to notice that one prisoner had freed himself. With the help from the sweat, blood, and feces covering the prisoner, he slipped out of the restraints. He had pulled so hard to gain his freedom, he removed the top layer of skin from his wrists and knuckles. At this part in the journal, this is where Dr. Olaf actually records the prisoner's name, Victor. He noted, Victor sprang from his bed, the guards shouted and raised their weapons. The researchers scattered about the small room, creating a whirlwind of chaotic movement. Somewhere, in the chaotic cloud of confusion and screaming, shots were fired. The blinded prisoner and the last remaining restrained prisoner were killed. Unfortunately, not all the bullets were true. One researcher was wounded and another killed. Victor sprinted down the hall looking to escape the facility. The remaining guards pursued him. In his confusion, Victor found himself back at the chamber he had been previously locked into. With the armed guards approaching, Victor sealed himself back into the chamber and barred the door with the remnants of the furniture. As the guards attempted to bash the door open, Dr. Olaf made his way to the observation room. Over the intercom, he could hear Victor in the room, laughing. Dr. Olaf clicked the intercom and began to speak. Victor! Victor! The growly voice from inside the chamber interrupted. There is no Victor. Dr. Olaf was silent, not sure how to respond. Dr. Olaf noted he could hear the smile in his voice when the response came. Was inside Victor, inside all of you. The animal kept in check by your civilized mind. The animal just below the surface. I am that thing you hide from in your beds every night, subdued into silence and paralysis when you sleep. The guards stormed through the door and executed Victor with a barrage of gunfire. They always say, be careful what you read on the internet. Don't always believe it. This story has been floating around the internet for some time. I traced it back to where I could find it, Creepypasta Wiki. It was a story by an unnamed author. Of course, the version I read to you was mostly written by me, based on that story. The funny thing is I found this story searching for evil experiments. And this one actually came up. When I researched it, I found it was a myth. It wasn't real. It was just a story out there that kept floating around. But hey, this is Evil Podcast. And on here, stories of darkness from history, myth, and legend. And special thanks to Magneto Fan for his review on iTunes. If you'd like to hear more, go to evilpodcast.com. You can also find us on iTunes. Please review and subscribe there. We're also found on Stitcher and Google Play Music. Links to all these players are, are found on our website as well. If you'd like to support the podcast, and please do, you can donate right on evilpodcast.com, buy a t-shirt through the store, or become a Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash evilpodcast. 
There's a link also on our website. Again, thank you for listening.